Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Happy Friday. My name is Pamela, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee. Um, so I call this meeting. I called meeting using the city WebEx technology and staff connecting by video conference or by calling in. As we are meeting remotely, technical issues. We have four registered public speakers today. The public can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. I would like to remind all staff and presenters to keep their mic muted with their video turned off unless they need to address the committee. This will make it easier for the co-chairs and those watching along on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate and vote on each item. Members, please keep your mic muted unless you wish to question staff or speak to an item and ensure that your video is turned on. As part of each agenda item, we will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. We will then create a speaker's list and will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or motion, I ask that members ensure they turn on their video and raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, I want to remind you that although you are participating remotely, you must still submit your motions in writing to the committee secretary. The clerk staff are available by email at ecdc at toronto.ca to help with motions. To start off the meeting in a, in a good way, we will now have the offering by Selena Young, Director of Indigenous Affairs Office, to be followed by an opening blessing by Francis Sanderson. Merci, Pamela. Not sure if you can see the smoke. I have uh, three of the medicines in my shell, uh, tobacco, cedar, sage. Ani Sego Hueche Biasu and Dishnakas Jijak, though them Momaskinaga and Dunjaba. Good morning. Jaminado Nokumis Mishamis, Creator, Grandfather, Grandmothers, Miigwech, thank you for this day, this beautiful day that we have. Thank you for the opportunity to sit together, to speak openly, to speak kindly, to speak passionately, but most of all, to speak respectfully to each other. Creator, we ask the grandmothers and the grandfathers of the four directions to visit with us, to guide us, to help us to shape a good meeting, a strong meeting, a meeting that's going to move us forward. We also ask those grandmothers and the grandfathers of the four directions to guide our two new chairs, to help them to be strong, to help them to be fair, to help them to be passionate, and to help them be respectful of all the conversations that's going to come their way. Creator, it's, it's all of our jobs to support new people, new jobs, new beginnings, new thoughts. And this is just an example of that. We ask the creator to watch over each and every one of us to guide us safely through this meeting and to make it something that we can be very proud of, that we're moving forward, we're answering questions, and, and we're, we're leading for our community. So for all these things, creator, we say miigwech, miigwech to miigwech. Miigwech, Francis, for those beautiful words. So although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee acknowledges the land that we are meeting on is traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of Credit, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. At this point, I would like to ask if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. If you have an interest, please raise your hand or unmute your mic to let us know. 
Seeing none, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes from our last committee meeting on February 10th, 2021? Francis? Larry, second. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. We will now proceed to consider the four items on the agenda. The first item is Indigenous Affairs Office update. I understand that Selena Young, director of the office, will provide an update to the committee. Over to you, Selena. I see Pamela. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Nods. Merci, Francis, for that wonderful opening and starting us in such a good way. I think it's especially important to hear those words and receive the medicines as these are really challenging times for so many in our communities. I sense an incredible mix of emotions. COVID cases are the worst they've ever been. Francis, I'm very saddened to hear about the outbreak at Shelby Homes. We're here for you if, if we can help in any way. There's also a lot of uncertainty around vaccine access. However, I know that many First Nations, Inuit and Métis are vaccinated, which brings some relief and hope. And we're seeing amazing things amidst all of this, we're seeing amazing things happening in community. People connecting in ways, in new ways that they haven't before, ceremonies happening in various parks and green spaces, and new Indigenous spaces opening up, like the Malvern Child and Family Centre, and lots more. The Indigenous Affairs Office has heard from some residents, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, about concerns related to vaccines, also concerns related to folks on the streets needing food in homes and struggling with their health and safety. While there's a lot of work to do, I'm very grateful for the leadership of Indigenous organizations and community members, including the members of the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee. I know you're working tirelessly to support community. It seems like so much time has passed, but it's really just been two months since the last committee meeting. I'd like to extend a huge welcome to the new co-chairs. We've had some good conversations in the Indigenous Affairs Office and other city staff are here to support you, Pamela and Brian, as well as the rest of the committee. The Indigenous Affairs Office continues to work with the Medical Officer of Health and Toronto Public Health to support Indigenous immunization including advocating at the provincial level for things such as vaccine supply and second dose intervals. We continue to support Toronto Indigenous Community Advisory Board, TCAB, and colleagues in shelter support housing and the Housing Secretariat on the rollout of the Indigenous Priorities and Housing TO. We have an overdue and welcomed meeting with Indigenous housing providers on April 26, so we can continue to build relationships, trust, and do the work that's needed uh, for and with community. We work closely with Toronto Council Fire and City colleagues and Councillor Layton uh, on getting a motion through City Council last week related to funding for the Spirit Garden, as well as some communication pieces. We were able to share the amazing fly through at the Council meeting, so huge merci to Andrea, Theo David, and the Toronto Council Fire team for their vision and leadership in making this possible. We continue to advocate for and assist Indigenous community and organizations navigate the labyrinth that is the City of Toronto. For example, we're providing ongoing support for the development of the Thunder Woman Healing Lodge. We're working with city colleagues and community to develop an approach for improving access to land and waters that supports community health and well-being. A few examples of this, there's work along the Humber River in Allen Gardens and with Native Child and Family Services and their on the land programming. In March, we were able to secure additional Section 37 capital dollars for the Indigenous Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So construction can start in the fall. We will be arranging a meeting with the Leadership Advisory Circle in May. We need to go to council with an update in July. So we'll be back to you, the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee, the next meeting in June. The Indigenous Affairs Office launched our second newsletter in March. The next one is scheduled for June. So if you have any ideas or content, we would love to hear from you. If any members of the committee or any members of community that are 
listening in uh, and uh, aren't on the mailing list for the newsletter, please let us know or we'd be happy to add you. We continue to provide advice and support to many city divisions. Some examples, we're supporting colleagues working on building Safe TO, a community safety and well-being plan. There will be some upcoming opportunities for Indigenous community members to share perspective, perspectives and we'll be sure to share that information with you. There has been quite an increase in city colleagues seeking guidance and advice on engagement and working with Indigenous peoples in a good way. So we do our best to respond and encourage colleagues to connect with Indigenous organizations, communities, and individuals. We continue to support our colleagues in clerks. I think some of them are <laughs> on the call in the meeting today on increasing Indigenous representation on boards and committees. And I'm sure we will be coming to this committee, coming to you soon to share those ideas and get your advice and guidance. We are supporting colleagues in people in equity on Indigenous learning opportunities pivoting from the in-person learning to a series of e-learnings and virtual circles for city staff. We've also updated the land acknowledgement internal guidance to remind city staff of the meaning and intent and to help them learn more about the land that they're on. This is especially important and timely given that we're all working virtually and, and in different locations. The Indigenous Affairs Community of Practice met recently with some additional members from divisions who weren't previously engaged. Uh, this is an important space for sharing and learning and driving change across the city of Toronto. We're also keen to have Indigenous organizations join future meetings, so if you request, let us know. I'm really excited to share that 12 Indigenous youth are starting at the city in the coming weeks with an incredible young Anishinaabe Kwe joining the Indigenous Affairs Office on Monday. For myself and the Indigenous Affairs Office team, the, the most significant update we have to share with you is that after 14 years, our incredible colleague, Donald Corbier, is moving on from the city. Today is actually his last day. Donald is moving back to his community, his family, back to Wiki on the island. I could take up the rest of the meeting talking about Donald's many gifts and all that he has brought to the city and our communities in Toronto. Donald was the first employee I had the privilege of hiring and helping create the Indigenous Affairs Office. Since the moment he joined, he brought his patience and kindness. He is incredibly grounded and focused in community. He always keeps community front and center. He unites people and, and creates spaces for ideas to take flight. I'm going to miss all of this and his humor and sage advice. I hope you will join me in sending all the best medicines to Donald on his path. We will miss him immensely and know that he is only a short paddle, a call, or a video away. Merci. Thank you, Selena. Um, and I just want to echo the words that you've expressed around Donald and wish him well. Um, members, do you have any questions on this item? If so, please raise your hand and unmute your mic. The floor is yours. Seeing none. Um, do I have a motion to receive this item? Larry, I give a motion to receive the item. Thank you, Larry. All in favor? Any opposed? The motion carries. Okay, the next item we have is filling vacancies in the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee membership. Um, we will begin with the registered public speaker on this item before moving it back to the committee. We have one registered public speaker. I will ask the committee secretary to confirm that our public speaker, Miguel Avila Velarde, is ready to proceed. Madam Chair, our mm -hmm. public speaker is ready to proceed. Thank you. Great, thank, Great. You. thank you. Welcome, Miguel. And welcome to the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee meeting. 
you have five minutes to speak. Sorry, there's a lot of um, feedback there. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. You have five minutes to speak. When you're getting close to the end of time, I will let you know. Okay. Please go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's good to see you uh, guys again. I, I think the last time I I was uh, this committee was uh, in 2019, I believe, before the COVID strikes. Um, so it's good to see a lot of you, Councilor Layton. Uh, it's good to see um, Francis uh, and Sanderson and, and our other members, uh, Jeb Schreifer, um, and and all the brothers and sisters here listening in. Um, I just want to tell you that I have some questions. If, if anybody from the city appointments are in attendance to this call today, because I have a questions about the vacancy on the city appointments website. It says that um, you have um, 90 members approved, and we are replacing, I believe, one member who has resigned as per letter dated uh, February the 10th. So I am a member of the community. Um, I, am a, I am a grassroots activist. And for the last 10 years, I have been attending City Hall, all the meetings from when David Miller was the mayor to Rockport and two times uh, John Tory. Um, I'm thankful for the Council of Fire for the opportunity to gain me after 10 years of not having a job. I was able to hire to be hired as a contractor and I was providing services to uh, uh, the good folks at the Council of Fire because they have been serving meals seven days a week, seven days um, interruptibly. Um, and it's good to see to meet all these people in the, in the street. So, I um, I'm not able to uh, uh, my contract is over, so I'm free. I don't I want to contribute to the city. Uh, I just want to say that I'm a member of the Regent Park uh, Neighborhood Association, the first tenant led with uh, condo residents working for the Regent Park community. I'm also want to say that I'm a member of the Community Benefits Agreement for the Regent Park phases four and five. So I am very um, active in this side of the city, but I want to contribute more, specifically areas like policing. Um, I have attended many uh, events where we have had sacred fires, and unbeknownst to me, we have, we have spoken this matter many times at the police services board, and they kept forgetting you know, the, 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 the instruction, the education, the good way, we tell them, you know, please respect indigenous traditions, right? So it's sad that some that they had used many times uh, fire extinguishers to 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 uh, shut off the sacred fire, and that is that is very sad to see. So that's what I want to contribute because I have a lot of experience at the front of police services, as you probably you are aware. I'm a regular um, a speaker, and also I'm um, I don't know. I don't know if uh, if my activism for being an active and you know and vocal active member of the community Aboriginal, by the way, I don't qualify for a seat. I can prove you that I have emails from the city appointments that I apply four times, four times for this seat, and not just this seat. I have applied for the Toronto Community Housing. I have applied for the Toronto Zoo, my former employer. I have applied for the city for uh, for Less Toronto. Less than one minute Service. remaining. So I just want to say that I finally did it online. I I have received a confirmation that my deputation is in, uh, my my application is in, and hopefully, please give me an opportunity. That's what I'm asking. I want to serve my community, and um, and I hope you won't regret it. Because I, I think and I, I, I can play nice with you guys because I, I love to serve the city. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? You know where to find me in Regent Park. Thank you Thank so you. much, Miguel. Um, does anyone have any questions for the public speaker?
Okay, seeing none, we thank you, Miguel, for your time today and for addressing the committee today. Um, so now we're gonna move the discussion on this item by sharing some slides prepared by the Indigenous Affairs Office, um, Jeff DeHaunt and clerk staff will help us in displaying those slides. And we wanted to sort of open the floor around the membership and the seats. Uh, we discussed this, I believe at our last meeting and had some ideas and brainstorming. So we wanted to bring it back and see if we can have some actionable items today in filling seats. So these are possible strategies for recruiting new AAAC members um, that we maintain requirement that the members represent organizations and fill eight vacant seats. Um, we can do a general call out to members. We can do targeted recruitment um, and the most straightforward approach it may limit participation from voices who do not wish to be represented by organizations or have limited access to organizations. After terms of reference to permit membership from community at large, i.e. new members that don't have, that do not represent organizations. And this may allow for more robust participation from community members, um, but it may be difficult to develop culturally based recruitment strategies, selection criteria that truly facilitates participation. I just wanted to open this over to Jeff and Selena if they wanted to add and provide some more historical context and present context. Thank you, Pam. I'll, I'll take this for now, Selena. And please um, jump in if you have any um, any uh, any words. So, for the members of the public that don't know me, I'm Jeff, and one of the staff at the Indigenous Affairs Office. I'm keeping my video off just because the, the internet where I'm at is not very strong. So I hope you folks can hear me. Um, but if I, but uh, anyway, I will do my best to uh, to speak with the connection I have. So um, there, there have been a few people that have, actually, have approached actually this iteration of the committee coming forward at times, saying um, that they feel the um, that the community isn't as well represented on the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee as they could be that um, having an organizational focus is great and certainly would want some of that, but some folks feel that um, there may be um, advantages to having members from the community at large. Um, there's also other folks that say, well, we, actually those organizations represent the community too. We certainly engage, we certainly engage with them in their uh, in, uh, roles elsewhere. Um, there's opportunity for the community to participate in the committee meetings as they, um, as they occur. Um, so, so it may be okay to actually maintain um, status quo. Um, and there's also been ideas floated, like perhaps their virtual town halls can be held at um, certain points. So there is an option um, three on the on, on the next slide. It's basically saying maintain status quo, but also have additional virtual town halls at times. Um, if we if the com committee decides that we great to get community feedback above me on what's possible the committee. Because the issue with getting feedback at the committee is um, some community members may not have, uh, may want more than five minutes. They may uh, not be able to make the meeting. Um, women in particular might struggle to make, to make meetings because of all the various requirements on them, or unemployed people might actually be trying to survive so they can't actually come to a committee meeting, those kinds of things. So lots of barriers to, uh, to potentially making a meeting. So there may be a way we can re like rejig the community engagement a bit to, um, to allow more participation from the community, or maybe the answer is to have more people on the um, on the, uh, the community itself. Not proposing, not, not forcing one on the other. I'm just trying to give it an overview as requested by the chair. So, long story short, there's been sort of three kind of camps sort of floating around. One is just continue doing business as usual, but fill all 25 seats available. Um, the second being, um, okay, fill all 25 seats, but change it so that if someone doesn't have to represent a community, so for example, sorry, a community organization, so for example, an elder or a youth representative or, or representative of, of another uh, aspect of the, the indigenous community. And the third option would be what I said earlier was just simply um, um, do what you're doing, have uh, members represent organizations, but figure out a way to engage with the public outside of the uh, committee meetings is to allow additional voices, especially on important matters affecting, say, housing, climate control, climate change, et cetera. So that's that's sort of the overall context. And I, I will pause here. Selena, do you have anything to add? No, you did a wonderful job. Thank you, Jeff.
Um, so members, does anyone have any questions or thoughts on this item? Um, if so, please raise your hand and unmute. Perhaps we can stop screen. Oh, thank you. Oh. Hi, this okay. is Tracy. How are you? <laughs> thank goodness it's Friday. So, um. I see that there is a need to uh, get more community voices with regards to the indigenous issues happening here in Toronto. And um, there are different ways we could approach this. Um, I see the idea of town halls um, as a possible option. Um, one of the things I guess I had hoped for and which possibly will happen is that um, uh, the members here would be um, eventually a, a part of um, groups to go into the community and and um, get their feedback and and uh, uh, hear about the issues going on within within their present organizations and their programs and services. This is what I was hoping um, that could be happened because each of us, we all come from different areas. We come from either a housing type of issues and and we come from, you know, uh, youth and family and and some from the uh, educational institutions like myself and uh, we have the ability to um, bring back that information. Um, I know that earlier some time ago we were talking about um, bringing in all for in my case bringing in educational institutions throughout the GTA finding out what the issues are of the Aboriginal students um, and the Aboriginal members of the educational institutions which are our um, universities and colleges and potentially other educational institutions. So um, that was uh, just a comment that I wanted to add. Um, I'm just wondering if we can um, relay back to the greater Toronto community um, who, who the actual individuals are that created um, uh, who can sit on this committee, the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, if we can give them that little short background history so that they um, are aware how it was created and why it was created, just in a very short synopsis. Thanks. Does anyone have the answer for that, for Tracy? Perhaps Mr. Layton? Uh, uh, Tasi, I, I don't know if I have the answer, but Tracy, to the point you're talking, um, the last point you were talking about sharing information, if I'm understanding correctly, I should preface. Um, for sure, we have space to enhance communications about the committee members, the background um, of the committee. Uh, yeah, all of that, I think, is. Um, is, is, you know, we can use various channels to do that and, and we'd be happy to support. It's Francis. Um, I like having options on, on what to do instead of being told, here's what you got to do. I like the idea of filling the void with members of organizations, agencies, um, that are representing a segment of the community. But I also like the idea of between meetings, having um, community meetings where people get their say, can voice their opinion, can put it on papers and have that directed back to the committee to consider. Uh, that would give the community members an opportunity to have their voices heard um, in in a in a um, a logical respectful kind way to have them bring uh, any areas that we 
are missing any areas that we're not focusing on any areas that have not been heard it'll bring it to the table um in a good way so i i think we should fill our board i mean we're missing an opportunity for more voices so we should fill our board with um, members who represent a segment of the community but also we have to listen to the community the people who are not um working in in uh the community who are not representing a segment of the community who are just who just have a strong passionate voice and want to have their say so i'd like there to be like a fourth <laughs> a hybrid option uh that we can we can uh utilize thank you miigwech Does anyone else have thoughts on that item? I do. Good morning, everybody. This is Andrea from uh, Toronto Council Fire. I have a, uh, I think we'll, we'll probably get into a little bit more details once uh, Ken uh, provides uh, his presentation on the TARP, because I imagine he's probably really thinking about wanting to speak to this issue. Um, but if, like for Council Fire, having the opportunity and looking at the history of us uh, creating the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee, um, we sat there to ensure that uh, the rep, you know, that the community members for us that we uh, knew that we provide services to, we don't ever have taken the position that we um, we represent them. You know, we're not uh, we're not a ward, we're not uh, councillors. <clears throat> but I just want to ensure that when we come together around any table, that we can bring uh, those positive as well as those uh, areas that we can we can join together on. I want to build on um, Tracy's comments because I think it is really critical that we have we also have uh, um, the education institutions and each of those students uh, will you know they have their own uh, I don't think they see that any of the uh, uh, institutions represent them as much as them having that choice of where to attend um, through COVID we've been fortunate to actually reach out to the students within the colleges uh, and to ensure that we're providing supports while they're, you know, while we're encouraging them as um, it's also representatives sitting at the table from our agency, uh, you know, they too are struggling. They are too are struggling, whether it's with housing, whether it's, you know, whether it's with food, whether it's in just uh, um, coping. And, and so I think uh, having a, um, a wider a representation of voices is really critical. And I think that's what you know, Ken will also speak to, but you know, this, the struggles over the years, trying to ensure that our voice is heard at different levels. And more recently you know, over the years with uh, the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, and then ultimately creating that, um, we're advancing the need for, you know, for an office, which is, you know, currently uh, occupied and, and staffed by uh, Selena and her team members. But, uh, um, I agree. I think that uh, I want to be really clear. Council Fire doesn't represent anybody. Uh, we what we do is we serve. We, there is a community that we do serve that uh, that fit in our area and, and outside. So um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And I think being inclusive is 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 um, is it would be really helpful for uh, you know for uh, for persons who want to come to the table and offer their their good their good minds their good skills and and their good thoughts about building building and contributing to a, the community that we have and and where they where they reside so it won't go um Pam for for allowing you to have this conversation or um, my comments now. Miigwech, Andrea. Does anyone else want to add to this? I think this is the time where we kind of carved out some space to allow for dialogue and, and brainstorming to ensure that we can move this forward and have a bit of action on making decisions on how we want to sort of open and fill the seats. And I think, you know, there is this balance between the agencies and the, commun the community and bringing them together um, through different avenues is going to be really important and to 
ensure that we take the right approach and strategy to provide platform and space for community members to be heard and perhaps in an environment where they're not where they're not staring at a clock um, where they might feel rushed or nervous by by that item so um, if you have any more thoughts please do share because we want to have as much ideas on how to best move forward um, to be inclusive but also you know remain some of the process and structure that um, we're used to already Brian. Thanks, Pam. Um, I want to first thank everyone for what you've had to say so far. I think they're they're excellent ideas. Um, and and just like Francis, when when somebody puts three options in front of me, I'm I'm going to think of a fourth instead. Um, so the the suggestions were that you know we either fill the seats as they are currently, or we alter the terms of reference, which could take a little while um, to include other groups. So I think by doing both of those things, as well as um, you know, pushing more community engagement, pushing town hall situations to make sure that people have their voices heard, it could be really effective. Um, I also think that it is uh, absolutely important that we do alter the terms of reference to include more than just organizational representation at this point. Um, just because there are so many groups that aren't being represented here, um, and and personally, you know, as as a as the head of of the only Inuit organization that's based in Toronto, just like Andrea was saying, I don't feel as though I represent all Inuit by any means. Um, but in our current structure, I'm the only person that gets to represent Inuit. Um, and I don't think that that's fair. So I think that we do need to open it up. Um, I think that we need to expand into uh, including indigenous healthcare providers, uh, two S LGBTQ plus youth entrepreneurs, um, land stewards. Because let's let's acknowledge where we are and what the knowledge is um, that exists around us with, within so many people that are not represented by organizations, um, knowledge keepers, and 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 just community members who are otherwise unaffiliated. Um, but that's my thought. Uh, I would I would love to hear more from everybody else. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? I just wanted to add, um, I like the idea of, of having um, a youth representative um, um, it would be a great thing to bring youth issues to the table um, from a youth who's who's um, who's um, experiencing day to day, um, you know, uh, issues or uh, his life or her life or their life, and uh, and and someone, you know, we could, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you'd probably want someone who has use the indigenous community programs and services as well so they have that ability to talk about you know the, the services that they use and and how helpful those have been to him or her or they and um um with the in with the elder uh we have so few elders um and um i know that some of them are being um um, asked to be, you know, um, working or sitting on various boards as it is. Um, I do like the fact of having an elder representative and uh, possibly there, there might be a way we can have an elder representative, um, um, different ones during different times. I don't know how we think about that further, but also um, I like the idea that what our community is using right now are around aunties because aunties aunties are um yeah they will soon be you know um and they're a great help and and they take on various roles as mother as you know guardian as caregiver as you know someone as helper in general so um we could also um think about that as possibly a representative um I would, uh, you know, I, I believe we should be widening the circle 
um, considering the skills and the experience and the lived, the lived experience and the Indigenous knowledge that that person brings. Um, we have so many um, nations of uh, people um, from Turtle Island that um, are residing in the Toronto area uh, that can be um, helpful and and um, bring a different lens and worldview to uh, some of the issues that cross our table. Um, and it would be it would be enlightening to hear what people have to say and um, to get that community participation. Gretch, thank you. Any other Hi, speakers? I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. So sorry. I can't turn my camera on. My internet is really bad today, it seems. It took me forever to get in. So um, I just want to agree with Brian that I, but I, I think that there needs to be consistency from what I just heard from Tracy, the idea of people who could come in and out, I don't think would actually provide an individual the the background they would need for some of those conversations. I think it's broadening, as both Tracy and uh, Brian said, is very, very important. Um, I like the idea of finding a way to do it sooner rather than later. Um, I do not, as somebody who, you know, I work at an educational institution, but don't actually engage the agencies. And, you know, as the original TARP talked about, it was that 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 middle class indigenous grouping that I think we need to find ways to draw in all of those people. That's I'm with I'm agreeing with Brian here. Nyawa. Anyone else? So I just want to add, I, oh, sorry, I go just, ahead, Tracy. Oh, I just go. wanted to clarify, like if we were to bring aunties or elders in, we could bring them in for a period of one year, two years, um, you know, um, or we could have two of them sitting at the table, you know, if one can't be there, the other will be there, that kind of thing. So, um, even the same with um, aunties, like there could be two and possibly if one can't, one can't be here, the other will be here kind of thing. And they could um, communicate with each other what, what they, what the other one missed if, if they're not both able to be here, for instance, just like we have with designates. I just wanted to um, highlight what Tracy was saying as she was sort of describing all these different roles and community members. It's very indicative of community and our traditions and sort of having roles and responsibilities, but also having space for the various roles and responsibilities. And it, it sort of creates this fabric of um, unity, this fabric of working together to execute what the community needs. And I, I really thought that that was very beautiful. And I think that that's an imagery that we should keep in mind um, as we want to move forward to try and reconstruct this. Um, are there any other items people want to bring up on this? Pamela, if we're talking about aunties, we have to talk about uncles too. Yes, agreed. I think there's space for every every member and every community member. Um, everyone has unique gifts and can offer something of significance when we're speaking about the community. Um, so I don't know how folks want to move forward. It sounds like we have, you know, an agreement to a blended approach to this. Uh, I'd like to say something. Please. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. I wasn't sure if, uh, when to speak. Um, but when we talk about groups, I also think um, in other terms of groups, uh, and that is that colonization is at the root cause of traumas for Indigenous people. So 
colonization has created groups like uh, uh, that we can that, that have survived. So we can uh, when we look at our community, um, there's groups of the houseless, uh, Indian residential school survivors, 60 scoop survivors, Children's Aid Society survivors. The uh, kids today are being taken uh, from their families. They're being stolen. There's uh, family members of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. There's indigenous human trafficking survivors. So I, 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 I don't wanna lose sight of the traumas that we face as uh, people that work within organizations and that people that are out in the community. And there's also um, people that have mistrust of the colonial institutions. Um, and you know we struggle with that uh, living in two worlds. So I don't wanna lose sight of the traumas that we are all dealing with and working with today, miigwech. Thank you, Millie. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion to receive this item? Tracy, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Any opposed? Okay, so the motion carries. Thank you. Can you read that motion, please? What you're advancing and what we voted in favor of, please, sir? It was just to receive the item, but if we'd like to explore an action motion to address what was discussed, we can definitely do that. If someone has um, a wording, they'd like to present forward. And if we don't, if we don't land on a motion right here today, what we can do is sort of um, collect the information that was taken, present it again at next meeting as an agenda item, and then maybe land on a motion at our next meeting. I know that we've discussed this at now two meetings and that we don't wanna prolong um, the process. Uh, so if anyone has ideas today, that would that's welcomed. Otherwise, we can ensure that we carry it to the next meeting um, and make sure that we sort of come up with some action items to move forward. Right. So I, I just have a question for the clerks, I guess. Um, is it is it possible for us to create a motion to um, to set up a subcommittee for reevaluating and rewriting the term, the current terms of reference. Okay, so I'm getting a text message response as we speak. Uh, if that's the wish of the committee, yes, but the terms of reference has to be amended first and the council has to approve it. Thoughts on a subcommittee to sort of iron out the terms of reference and a pathway to sort of bring in new members. Do we like that approach or do we want to bring this as another agenda item next meeting? Okay, so seeing Seeing none, we can motion to, which we already did, to receive the item. If anyone would like to present a motion to move forward, please do now. And if no motion is moving forward, then uh, we will work with the IAO to present this again at the next meeting and perhaps uh, present a motion. Comments? Concerns, ideas, okay, great. Okay, so the motion was received and passed. And I'm going to pass over the reins to my co-chair, Brian. 
Thanks, Pam. Uh, excellent job, by the way. Um, the next item is item AA10.3, the Toronto Ravine Strategy Update and Developing Economic Opportunities for Indigenous Businesses. We will begin with the staff presentation on this item. We will then hear from the registered public speakers before moving it back to the committee. I understand that Wendy Strickland, project manager of the Ravine Strategy, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, and Jeff DeHaunt, consultant, Indigenous Affairs Office, will provide a presentation to the committee. Ms. Strickland, when you're ready. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, and maybe if we could, uh, clerks, if we can pull up the presentation, that would be great. Clerks, um, there's a presentation, correct? Yes, yeah, sorry, Chair. This is Sylvia from the City Clerk's Office. I am trying to pull up the presentation on my end, and I'm having some technical difficulties. My uh, computer is freezing. So I'm just going to see if one of my colleagues can take over that role and present on my behalf. Just one second, please. Thank you, Sylvia. Mr. Chair, I will display the, uh, the presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, and um, thank you for having me here today. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned by clerks, my name is Wendy Strickland. I am the project manager for the Ravine Strategy within Parks, Forestry, and Recreation, and I'm here today to provide the committee with an update on the Ravine Strategy. And along with uh, Jeff Dehant, who spoke earlier uh, from IAO, um, to begin a discussion on exploring the feasibility of developing economic opportunities for Indigenous businesses related to ravines and placemaking. The so next slide, please. Uh, and before we go further, I wanted to recognize um, the important connection between Indigenous peoples and the ravines um, that we've heard um, previously and that we have kept this in our minds um, while developing the strategy and advancing the work to date. Next slide, please. Uh, the city has heard that Indigenous placemaking and placekeeping, including the Indigenous component of the Ravine Strategy, are important steps towards Indigenous self-determination, improved health connections, access to ceremonial spaces, and connection to economic opportunities. The Ravine System provides significant placemaking opportunities to reflect the integral connection that continues today between Indigenous communities and Toronto's natural spaces and waterways. Next slide, please. And I also want to take a moment um, to reflect on the whole of Toronto's ravine system. Many people, um, myself included, are often very familiar with their local ravine, um, but I thought I'd give some context of the ravine system as a whole across Toronto before we go further. So this map shows the extensive ravine system um, that we have here in Toronto and how much of the city the ravines actually touch. It also shows a bit of the magnitude of what the implementation of the strategy will begin to tackle to ensure that the continued protection, use, and enjoyment of the ravines by, by our current and our growing population. So the ravines themselves are, are quite a significant part of the landscape. There are about 11,000 hectares of land, which is 17% of our total land area. They also contain most of the city's environmentally significant areas. And they contain about 5,700 hectares of parkland. So about two thirds of our parks are actually located within Toronto's ravine system. Next slide, please. So recognizing how important the ravines are and the incredible and growing pressures that they are experiencing, the city developed Toronto's first ravine strategy. The ravine strategy provides an intentional and coordinated vision and approach to managing this natural resource on an ongoing basis through a series of 20 actions under five guiding principles, protect, invest, connect, 
partner and celebrate. The strategy guides the man management of the ravines and ensures the protection of these irreplaceable lands is balanced with their use and enjoyment so that they continue to bring nature to people and flourish for the next hundred years and beyond. My colleague um, first spoke to the Aboriginal Affairs Committee during the development of the strategy back in October of 2015 to get the committee's input on issues, opportunities, and the guiding principles. And coming out of that, the committee, out of that committee meeting, we had a request for further discussion and met with the Métis Nation of Ontario. The strategy itself was adopted by City Council in October of 2017, and a report on how the strategy will be implemented over the next 10 years was adopted in January of last year. Next slide, please. So the city is actually currently advancing a number of items as part of implementation of the strategy. And I thought I would highlight for you today a couple of items and have focused on these as they are um, relevant to uh, the committee, but also to the discussion a few minutes in, on uh, economic opportunities. Uh, firstly, the city will be la uh, launching a ravine campaign to rally community support, build energy, and generate additional funds to protect, maintain, and improve Toronto's ravine strategy, or Toronto's ravine system. The simple goal is to accelerate the implementation of the strategy. Through the campaign, we will establish a leadership table made up of Torontonians and philanthropists who love and support the ravine. They will support the campaign and the strategy by serving as external cheerleaders and acting as a sounding board for, uh, for projects. The leadership table is envisioned to include a pathway for an Indigenous representative. The next uh, initiative to let you guys know about is the Into the Ravines program, which is a partnership with Park People, which aims to mobilize and reach new communities and build a sense of connection and care for Toronto's ravines. It's a two-year pilot program that started last year with a mix of small grants, events, and community programming that connects people to ravines to create a deeper understanding of ravine ecology and the goals of the strategy. Uh, in 2020, like many other projects, um, we had to pivot to uh, virtual programming, um, but we, were, we did offer a number of uh, webinars, including things like uh, drawing on ravines with panelists native plant expert Lorraine Johnson and scientific illustrator and Métis culture keeper Jen McGuire and an Indigenous Storytelling and Ravine Ecology webinar with panelist storyteller Hillary Claremont, historian and artist Philip Cote, and Indigenous grower Isaac Crosby. The second year is well underway with a number of events coming up, including a Community Champions Program that has recently begun, three upcoming webinars um, on birdsong, drawing in ravines, and forest therapy in uh, May, and a micro-grant program to support community park groups and organizations in activating the ravines, which will launch in early May. We have also launched a student internship program in partnership with the Toronto Conservation Authority. The Ravine Youth Team is a paid summer uh, internship program for post-secondary students that provides work, professional development, and network growth experiences for a wide range of work that supports and contributes to the Ravine strategy. And applications for that um, for 2021 are to open soon. Um, just trying to get that through all the paperwork through for that. Uh, we're also partnering with LEAF, which is a local organization um, that focuses on urban forestry. And we're partnering again with them in 2021 on a young urban forest leaders program that offers youth a free four month mentorship and training program in arboriculture and urban forestry the YUFL program seeks to support Toronto youth from underrepresented groups within arboriculture and urban forestry, including, but not limited to, women, non-binary people, Indigenous peoples, newcomers, LGBTQ2S plus persons, and racialized individuals. And we're also exploring this year a one-month focused ravine YUFL program for the fall. Uh, next slide, please. With uh, staff and the and with, in PFR and IAO, we have been directed to explore, in collaboration with economic development and indigenous organizations and communities, the feasibility of developing economic opportunities for indigenous businesses 
that contributed to the goals of the Toronto's ravine strategy and Indigenous placemaking in Toronto's parklands. Some initial ideas on these opportunities to sort of prime the pump for the discussion today are things like consultants for professional services, such as park master planning and landscape design, resource production, such as plant nursery stock, engagement and teaching opportunities, grant funding for ravine art projects, and support of internship programs associated with specific professions, such as arborists uh, targeting Indigenous students. So uh, next slide, please, and I'll turn it over to Jeff. Okay, sorry about that. I was just struggling with the mute button, but here we are. Um, so yes, I do have some questions for consideration, but I just want to pause because I need to ask a procedural question. Is it more appropriate to hear from um, the community at this point, or can we ask these questions and have folks uh, pipe in later? I want to do what's uh, correct. So, clerks, can you clarify? Or Pam, you want to go with Brian? Um, personally, Jeff, I would uh, encourage you to go through the entire presentation and then we would move on to the Q&A. Okay, perfect. Just, just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah. yeah, so um, so if folks can get the, uh, so if clerks can get the, the question back up, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so we do have a couple questions for consideration today. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask both of them so you can kind of think on both, but we'll come back to question one and discuss it first. So the question is, who should we speak with, with to explore economic opportunities in ravines? And what groups and organizations should we engage? Now, I just want to pause here just for a bit of context. We're also aware of the cultural significance of, of this. Um, so it, it doesn't always have to be st about straight ahead business and economy. Um, there, there may actually be some cultural considerations that um, we need to think of. So that, that's, I just want to make sure that's clear that, that that's open. Um, because it may be that some of the discussions need to be about ceremonial space and creating that and actually building it and things like that. So we have to think that through. Question two, are you aware of existing initiatives or opportunities that might support the indigenous component of the ravine strategy? So, I'll, so keep that one in the back of your head, but I'll rewind to question one. Um, so who should we speak with to explore um, economic opportunities in ravines and what groups and organizations should we engage? And I thank you for your feedback at this point. Hi, may I say something? Sure, go ahead, Mel. Um, uh, one group to engage with is uh, the houseless. As I looked through the slides, and uh, uh, it was, uh, it seemed that the houseless were invisible to me, and I can relate to that. I'm a Nishnabe Quay, and I live in a forest, and. Uh, um, we try to protect the forest from clear cutting. And another thing that was missing from the presentation for, for me from an Anishinaabe Quay perspective was uh, the animals as well. Um, uh, I come from people that um, have developed clans based on animals. And so I think those are two groups that I would suggest that you need to engage with and think about. Um, I. Uh, live in a forest where uh, uh, people around me are abused, the animals are abused uh, and murdered, um, uh, the plant life is disregarded, and uh, pollution is setting in that destroys um, our food. Uh, um, from my perspective, our food and pharmacy is in the forest. That's where our medicine plants is. And that's where our food is. And um, so I see a, a complete, almost a complete worldview missing from this presentation. I appreciate the presentation, um, but it does seem to stand on the side of colonialism. And so I'm here to stand uh, for a different worldview. And I appreciate you listening to me, Jimmy Gwetch. Thank you, Millie, and uh, thank you, Ms. Strickland and Mr. DeHaunt for the presentation. We're now going to hear from the registered public speakers, and then we'll bring it back to committee for questions of staff and speakers. 
We have two registered public speakers. So I will ask the committee secretary to confirm that our first public speaker, Edith George, is ready to proceed. Uh, yes, I'm, oh, I'm ready to proceed. Okay, go ahead when you're Okay, thank you for letting me speak on this item. My name is Edith George and I have lived in the Northwest area of Toronto since 1960, an area whose historic value has been hidden. I am also a very strong advocate for the protection of our natural heritage, which includes trees. I fought for the great red oak, a sacred tree for First Nations of all North America. And last December, 2020, after 14 years of advocacy with city and public funds, the tree property was sold to make a city parquet. A tremendous potential to showcase Aboriginal work in this parquet and should be a future consideration for indigenizing public space. I am lobbying that this tree parquet have a First Nation name. Replant nursery stock, Gus Lagos, a biologist, lives in my area and worked with the city with providing red oak saplings and viable acorns from the identical DNA of the red oak. He also owns a 27 acre tree nursery in Grand Valley, Ontario. And my understanding is that he is more than happy to be involved in resource production of various native tree species. Gus has already spoken with Wayland D'Souza of TRCA Plant Nursery. The Humbermead neighborhood where I live is surrounded by ravine and green space. The city has leased a former Catholic school, now named the Carmine Stefano Community Center, located at 3100 Western Road, which is completely underutilized since the leasing of this building and its two soccer fields in 1999. An amazing opportunity to use this property for Indigenous teachings, read the building and outdoor space surrounding the area. The historic Toronto Caring Place Trail was located going through this sector. Emory Village BIA brought forward in 2017 a proposed First Nation Park for the northeast corner of Finch and Weston. Three First Nation chiefs wrote letters in support of this project. My understanding is that the BIA is waiting for the three pipeline approvals to use the hydro corridor. I would say that this is similar to a Meadowway project. Please note former Councillor Jim Hart, who voted for this national park in October 2017, came to see this site April 1, 2021. And another councillor who voted for this proposed site is Councillor Michael Layton. Furthermore, Roundtree Mills Park it's a 227 acre park located in the northwest corner of my ward, the fifth largest in Toronto. It has been under lockdown for over 12 years, which was implemented by former councillor Mamaliti. We've been trying to open this park up and this item, AA 10.3, would be the breakthrough reopening up the park. You would have a clean slate to form ideas with park staff, re-First Nation venues, teachings, etc. I read through the Toronto Ravine strategy update and the Northwest area of Toronto, the forgotten corners can play a role with our ravines, parks, placemaking, and even a proposed First Nation park to tell First Nation stories. The First Nations were here first and before I open it up to questions, I just want to share this because this is, I'd be remiss not to do this. People and Edith, um, just letting you know, you have 50 seconds. Okay. People and groups who have come here are TRCA, Daryl Gray, Director of Education and Training, and his right hand, Colin Love, Donica Vachi, Interim Manager, Manager of Parks, uh, the two school board trustees plus outdoor educators and superintendents, news media, former counsel Suzanne Hall and Selena Young and Jennifer Prince of the Indigenous Affairs Office and Officer Monica Rutledge of Toronto Police Services is trying to make up a meeting and walkabout of this area. 
Chi Miguesh. And I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you for your remarks, Edith. Um, members, do you have any questions for the public speaker? Councillor Lee. Yes, thank you. This is just about the park that's cut off um, that, uh, that I, I don't know if it's fenced off. Can you give us a little bit more details of, of that? It's not something I'm familiar with. So. Okay, it's a, it's a park. It's the Round Tree Mills Park. Um, we, it's it's uh, in the Northwest Quadrant. Uh, former Suzanne Hall, so you'll, uh, Councillor Suzanne Hall, actually, and this was in the paper, and, she, and quote, it's, it seemed a shame to me because it's the largest park we have in the North End. It seems an absolute shame. It couldn't be opened up and some type of security put in to assist with with the concerns. So she feels it's got the potential of being um, like High Park. And um, there's two developing areas adjacent to this park. And Councillor Layton, my understanding is um, uh, Councillor uh, Mamaliti closed it, quote, due to complaints by area residents of criminal activity and row rowdy parties, end quote. And um, park people, Manaz Asani Kanji, he just, um, sh she's just kind of shocked that it has not been completely wide open to the public. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the speaker? I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the right part. This is the part between Islington and Kipling. North of Finch, south of Steeles. Uh, yes, that's Roundtree Mills, but also, ma'am, uh, the um, 3100 Weston Road site, the lease site. Uh, it, it's just, that one there has just so much tremendous potential. Read that leased building that's basically been empty since 1999 to be used for First Nation studies. And I'm offering this up to all of you because Monica Rutledge is trying to set up. A date to do a walkabout after we get this COVID settled. Please take me up in the offer and please come and visit this amazing place where I live and visit the Great Red Oak. Any further questions, members? Okay, well, hearing none. I will ask the committee secretary to confirm that the second public speaker, who is Sheila Boudreau, School of Urban and Regional Planning, Faculty of Community Services, Ryerson University, um, is ready to speak. Mr. Chair, I can confirm that the uh, second public speaker is ready to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can go right ahead, Sheila. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and also for the really the important work that you all do. Um, and my prayers are with you all during these difficult times. So my name is Sheila Boudreau. I live in the Don watershed in the east end of the city with my husband and my three grown children. Um, I'm of mixed settler and Mi'kmaq descent. I'm also a landscape architect, a planner, and an educator at Ryerson and University of Toronto. Um, and in discussions with Indigenous colleagues, friends, and um, even the Toronto Aboriginal um, uh, Social Services, Support Services Count Council, a few, maybe a couple of years ago, um, I founded a social enterprise called Spruce Lab, where I could focus on nature, all our relations, uh, prioritizing Indigenous voices, and decolonization through teaching, training, and involving youth and emerging professionals in the work that we do. And I work closely with Indigenous friends and colleagues in a variety of projects. I'm also a member of the Friends of Smalls Creek, a local community group focused on the protection and stewardship of the Smalls Creek and Williamson Ravine environmentally sensitive area. Um, and we sent a letter as the women of Smalls Creek to the First Nations to let them know about the work we're doing there and to um, thank them for that opportunity. And I've given a lot of thought about um, uh, the idea of Indigenous involvement in, in the ravines and um, 
and the economic development opportunities through the work that we we have been doing and, and have been planned. When I was an urban designer with the city of Toronto uh, for six years until 2017, I questioned why we were not involving indigenous people in the work that we did. Um, I also learned that in Canada, there was only one indigenous landscape architect with status, which weighed very heavily on me. So I'm sharing my stories today as examples of what are possible. Through the work I was doing at the city, I reached out to the then First Nations School of Toronto and invited the youth um, through the teachers to co-design a green infrastructure project I was working on. Elder Pauline Shirt worked with them. They created a program and beautiful traditional beading focused, um, inspired by uh, Nibi and the sacredness of water, which will be made into large scale art panels. Following my time at the city, I led the landscape architecture team at the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority. I learned about a youth employment program for immigrants. I learned about a Girls Can Too skills training program at Bolton Camp, and I wondered why we didn't have an Indigenous youth program. With guidance from Fred Martin, then with the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto, I initiated and co-founded an elder-led employment training program to introduce youth, Indigenous youth, to landscape architecture and a wide variety of environmental work opportunities. That's now known as Nikabi Dawadina Gigwag, which means Flooded Valley Healing. Um, and it's now in its fourth year at U of T, and I remain a mentor. And other things through TRCA, um, I mean, they're guardians and stewards of the ravines. I, while I was there, I advocated for Indigenous engagement in the Meadowway project. Um, in particular, the bridge crossings at Highland Creek and Ellesmere Ravine. Um, I also asked for an Indigenous artist on the new head office pro uh, project. I was the design on the designer involved with that, which is also at Black Creek. And Indigenous content in the trail strategy for the greater Toronto region. Um, there were numerous opportunities for placekeeping for, with Indigenous engagement. Um, one of them was the Goodwood Trails Plan. There's a lot of work to be done for that kind of work to happen. Um, I'm very pleased to see some of it is underway. The entire, I just want to make a big statement here, but um, I do think the entire ravine system should be made an Indigenous protected area. I think Indigenous guardians should be hired and youth should be trained to work on the land and, and with the water, and that we need to begin to honour Indigenous peoples in a meaningful way through everything we do in the ravines across the city, but the ravines were close to you know, nature as much as we can be. The water was never part of the treaties. Currently, I'm involved with the Ontario Urban Forest Council to create a mobile app, uh, storytelling uh, interactive experience that is focused on the Caring Place Trail, heritage trees and lost rivers with many partners involved. Um, and that's actually, I met uh, Edith George through the, the efforts to protect the Great Red Oak and visited the First you, Nations um, Park. You have 30 seconds, Sheila. Oh, okay. So um, we visited the First Nations Park and um, thinking about how we could, why don't we have four parks in all of the cardinal directions of the, of the city in the different treated areas? And there's so much potential. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, I wrote a letter and the Friends of um, Smalls Creek also wrote a letter. And that overall, I think we need to think holistically about these systems, about relationships, and not on a project by project basis. Thank you, Jimmy McWitch. Thank you. Thank you for addressing the committee. Uh, members, do you have any questions of staff on this item? Um, if so, please raise your hand or unmute your mic to let me know. Uh, Jeff Schiffer. Okay. It's just more of a comment, really. I just want to thank Sheila for coming and sharing that information. Um, you know, I, I really like the idea of, I think about the city's work around the Indigenous placemaking strategy, you know, the opportunity that, that the ravines uh, provide for, um, I guess, a more coordinated strategy and designation of that, as I, I really like the idea of, of Indigenous protected land. And I just want to say, Reflecting on the on the land work that we've done over the last year that's really been driven by community, we're also hearing that in the context of this pandemic, um, you know, the mental health and other challenges that people are experiencing are really well mediated through trauma informed land based practice and obviously not only parks, but the ravines provide a striking opportunity, not only for social enterprise um, teachings around indigenous worldview and knowledge and, and reconciliation, um, but also, you know, work that brings family and community together in ways that promote holistic wellness. 
uh, and provide pathways to education and employment for the community. So I just want to say Chimi Gwit, Sheila, for coming uh, and, and speaking with the, with the committee uh, today. Thanks. Thank you for that. Are yeah. There, I, oh, Andrea, sorry, go ahead. I guess I guess one statement would be to start off with is uh, is who are, you know, and I think uh, I want to I want to give a shout out because this is such amazing conversation. This is something that we're talking about. I'll start off with my sister from Africa who who always remembers and brings us back to the ground where we come from and all the relatives that were here. So I say who are to you uh, uh, and she regrets she quite. Um, and, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Wendy Strickland and Sheila. This this is such tremendous dialogue that can and we talked about expanding our our numbers and our persons and 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 remembering, reminding ourselves, you know, why we are here, why we do sit on these sit on these different tables. And in terms of uh, Millie, Millie talks about the houselessness. And so I know with the uh, council fires. First uh, group uh, that we started in the 80, late 80s and 90s, uh, the majority of our um, our clients uh, were lived in the ravines, and so that's a, that was their home. So I understand very clearly what she's saying. Looking at the plant life is is also tremendous, and and I'm really happy to hear about the the planting and the landscaping. And I know that there's colleges that we're working with that offer that uh, that offer the the landscaping, and I I, I also think about Mesa Webeck. Who offers the employment so then that we can have uh, bring on uh, different workers. Our partnership with the Evergreen Brickworks, who also is a part of that, but there's no reason why we can't expand. So each uh, each of you, I say, I won't go uh, um, to you, uh, Melly, as well as to Sheila and uh, and Wendy, and I, I will definitely look at uh, reaching out to you because right now all of us are working on place making and it's better making and uh, for our for our community. So you won't go for your uh, presentations it's uh, really encouraging now thank you very Welcome much Nick, andrea thank you um are there any more speakers to the item tracy king yes um i just like to concur with uh jeff and jeff and uh, andrea about um the need for us to um protect the land and to use the land because the the land is healing and and uh i hear so many um uh people from out of town for instance that that refer to toronto jokingly as the concrete jungle and and uh in some ways it's in some ways in in some parts of toronto it is true and I think in those areas that we have left with the with the you know with the animal life and the plant life that we should really think about um, conserving and preserving those those lands where they are. I'd love to see that um, our knowledge keepers, our elders, and so forth, um, who are able to connect to spirit in the land. And there are some that are in Toronto. I can speak. Um, off camera about that, who actually can speak to the spirits in the in the trees, or you know, uh, the spirits of uh, the different uh, living beings in the forest, and and find out, you know, um, what is it that they need, what is it that they would like, you know, those kinds of things. And I think we have to, you know, think about those traditional those traditional teachings that uh, many of us been have. Um, been brought up with or have learned through our lifetime and and um, be able to honor those things because you know um, the land is mother earth that's what heals us and uh, a lot of our medicines western medicines are made of those those plant life right and just wanted to add yeah I really like the discussion of these two presenters which Thank you, Tracy. Um, yeah, it's it's really great to see how inspired everyone is from this presentation and these speakers. Uh, this is this is excellent. It's great to hear it, um, Mr. Layton. Yes, I, I would just add um, there is a tremendous opportunity here. There is a lot of excitement not only on city council, um, but at other levels of government and other agencies to take 
better care of these spaces. But I don't think I, I don't think there's the greatest grasp of how to achieve that. And certainly the capital budgets aren't quite there yet, um, but they will come. I'm I'm actually quite confident that we will see a major investment in ravine stewardship in the next uh, in in the next two, three, five, ten years. We have already increased the budget. Uh, to ravine stewardship, but I think the opportunity here is uh, ensuring that the approach that the city takes and the voices that they're hearing in in and how we take that approach um, are, uh, are 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 grounded in uh, the in indigenous uh, uh, um, water keepers and 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 those uh, land protection uh, involved in land protection uh, because. If we don't, then we would have missed a huge opportunity because this, like, like this is going to provide a framework for how we restore and protect the ravines for the decade to come. And uh, so, if we don't connect our city staff with the right people now, I, I, I fear we will, we may have lost that window. I really like the idea that Sheila brought up about, um, uh, uh, about bringing in um, indigenous, uh, in, in, in more indigenous individuals to help actually perform some of that work. I think there's a big opportunity there from an employment angle. Um, and if there are any organizations, I know of a couple working in that space, um, but if there are any that uh, the that, that people have that can they they can provide to our staff, I think that would be quite useful um, and and would um, would help naturally address some of the various issues uh, in the statement of commitments that the city has as well as um, uh, some of the other responsibilities the the and 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 uh, and plans the city wants to achieve. Um, so uh, I think whatever advice we can give staff now, uh, if it's in this meeting or offline, I can help make a connection as well. But I just like there, there is uh, hundreds of millions in investments that will go into the ravines. Let's make sure that we're that 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 this group and the indigenous community in and around Toronto is helping guide how that money is spent and maybe ensuring that. Someone's getting paid for the work that's being done, and and uh, it would be good to connect that with indigenous uh, youth and, and and experts that are involved in in that kind of work, um, because again, that's an opportunity we don't want to let pass. I work with, I should say, I I was in Mud Creek um, this uh, this week with my kids. It was March break, um, so I had booked off a tiny bit of time, and we went for a, a walk in Mud Creek. And and you know like the amount of work uh, we we have a two year study going on um, about how the how the water wants to move and figuring out how we can restore its natural movement um, and then with that uh, there's a recreational component um, but also a biodiversity component and within the work that we're doing um, in Mud Creek specifically uh, uh, has has generally speaking lacked indigenous voices and I, I I'm kind of ashamed to say that out loud because I've been working on it for about a year and a half now with um, five different community associations as well as the TRCA and city staff. Um, and that's something that uh, it, it, I think more has to do with uh, the lack of knowledge that our departments may have about experts um, from the indigenous uh, it, from the indigenous knowledge uh, uh, segment of, uh, of society that uh, we need to we need to somehow drive that connection. And if, if it's not mm -hmm. happening in the context of my work locally, then I, I I think it's probably more difficult from from the perspective of other city councillors maybe doing the same work. So I will endeavor to do that job better as well. Can I just Tracy? Oh, can Go I just ahead, add Lisa. one thing? Um, can is there a possibility to get funding that's going to be uh, longer in length? Because I know that we provides funding, but often you know it's you know, for a certain amount of time, it could be like for the summer, which is four months, or it could be for six months, or it could be for eight months. Is there one of the things I find, because um, I, I work in human resources, is finding longer term employment opportunities, because once that person finishes that four month contract, that like they're, they're, they're stuck again, they're unemployed for a long period of time. But to to find monies that will keep, like for instance, um, this I could see this as an, um, you know, um, um, youth employees getting involved in this early, and then and possibly working with um, um, 
different specialists in the field and our own knowledge keepers and so forth. And then uh, this could be a possible entry in um, entryway into college or university or upgrading because you know they've they've seen something that they've really liked and they want to proceed in that kind of career uh, with the with the environment. So yeah, funding is a really big issue in our community, especially when it comes to these great projects which only get a certain allotment and then and then the community members or the people working for them get cut off and they're unemployed for months at times because the unemployment rate is so high in Toronto, especially now with the pandemic. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I just want to remind people to make sure to raise your hand so you can be called upon so we can kind of limit some of the, the crosstalk. Um, so, uh, I think the order that I saw it was Tanya and then Andrea. Tanya, if you can go ahead. Um, thank you, miigwech and Marcy. Uh, I'm in agreement uh, with everybody. I think this is a really wonderful opportunity. Um, thanks for the presentation, um, Sheila, Edith and Wendy. Uh, this is uh, very promising uh, in order to protect the uh, ravine and uh, that indigenous way of knowing and being and that connection to the land. I think it'll be really important to center indigenous ways of knowing and being and to involve youth so that there um, are opportunities seven generations forward in maintaining and protecting the land and opportunities for young people um, through an intergenerational model to uh, experience uh, Indigenous uh, land-based um, pedagogies, learning opportunities on the lands through the ravines. So very, very much in support of this. Andrea, when you're ready. Go, uh, Brian, and as well as uh, Tracy and uh, uh, Tanya, appreciate your comments. I think there's there's some things that are in front of me that I mentioned, but what I wrote down uh, from Edith's presentation was the protect, invest, connect, partner, and celebrate. And that's pretty it's pretty uh, awesome to uh, to follow that that sort. Uh, I in my mind, uh, the first person or group that I would look at being entrusted with the you know with the funding would would be our employment and training um, organization, which is Mesa Webeck, who is also very familiar with providing. Um, uh, funds uh, that for the, you know, for the gardeners and they do have other partners and I agree with Tracy that uh, it needs to be a longer term. So, if that was a process for us establishing um, a program that would allow the individuals to work this summer and then go through the go through the, the, uh, uh, the academics that you know, and I guess the other portion would be assisting them with scholarship because it has to be more of an investment. It can't just be it can't be just a uh, temporary. Um, so I think uh, I think uh, in terms of um, Jeff's uh, question, uh, mine would advance. I would advance a maze way back. I think you already have some. You have the the lady from the forest, the forest lady, Quay uh, Quay uh, Nap. Uh, I think you already have a, a couple of the other individuals, you know, from their own um, planning um, background, and, and I'm sure that I'm sure that they can. Uh, uh, look at developing a plan because of their own experiences and then take into account um, things that are already working like evergreen workforce and i know that uh, jeff has been doing uh working with his groups for the you know the land base uh, uh teaching too as well so there's there's lots to draw on so i'd like to respond to that question that was last asked by by jeff in in advancing maze webeck and these three ladies of uh of contributing you know? Yes, thank you, Andrea. Um, I was actually just looking for Jeff's questions so that we could kind of refocus on those in case people had uh, had responses to them. Um, clerks, I was wondering if it might be able might be possible to put those up, unless everybody has them. I see Francis has them. <laughs> Yeah, Jess' first question was, who should we speak with? 
to explore economic opportunities in ravines and what groups and organizations should we engage? And I think we've got a clear cut answer in that we, you know, we absolutely have to include. There may be others, and I'm sure there are others, but we have to include Mizuibi to uh, to be part and parcel of that. And the second question is, are you aware of existing initiatives or opportunities that might support the Indigenous component of the ravine strategy? Um, I can I can say that uh, you have to uh, other initiatives. Yes, every elder that's walking on on Mother Earth right now is is the teacher is the one who knows is the one who is is uh, a protector and the ones who are the teachers of the next generation. So everyone who is who is interested is a teacher and should be should be part and parcel of that initiative. Thank you, Francis. So, are there any further statements from members? Brian, it's it's Mike here. If I could just add one point, um, we have sure. been working with um, a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Richard, and it goes under the name Ontario Earth Keepers, and uh, who has been doing plantings with uh, Indigenous youth. Um, as part of eco restoration, I believe he did some in the Humber a couple of years ago that may have had conflicted with what Parks was trying to do in a certain area and that perhaps could have had some better coordination. Um, but he, he's been doing some work locally um, with the permission of the city and some support from the city. Um, I don't know what exactly the connection is with an Indigenous led organization, but certainly I think it's. Um, something at least worth exploring. It's been all over the city, including in Scarborough and in my ward in downtown and I guess at the Humber. So that would be one um, one option. But they, there's also out of the brickworks, um, the city has a unit that coordinates volunteers in the ravines. Um, but in more recent years, we've started to put dedicated set asides. It's seasonal, so it it may fit funding for part of what we're talking about here already. Where we're putting aside more money um, for the the removal of invasive species, uh, which is a, a a significant problem to the um, to the ecosystem in the ravines. Um, and that is actually very not particularly difficult work, but you need to know what you're doing. And so there may be um, th there might be an existing funding envelope and opportunity there um, if we kind of hold out some of the annual resources to the city staff that coordinate those programs and some of the seasonal resources to hire more people uh, that could get set aside and um, for for a, an indigenous uh, ravines protection restoration whatever we call, whatever it's called um, and and bring in some um, uh, some employees that uh, some indigenous employees or partner with an with an agency like Ms. Way Beak or or another one who I, I I don't know who would be the best to hold that precise niche of expertise. Um, but there may be existing resources, so that would be my advice to staff: is try to find some existing resources, see if we can parcel out what was planned, the planned increase from from this year for invasives, and maybe we can target it at engaging. Um, with indigenous youth or indigenous ind uh, indigenous people to try to start delivering uh, that work and to help to help shape the uh, how the city is doing that work in, in in these spaces. Thank you, Mike. And I saw Jeff Schiffer's hand. Yeah, I so I just want to thank. Um, I just really I I love the for, the word the, the way that Andrea summarized that with the words that she captured and I just want I just I really agree with Ms. Way Beak driving a lot of the economic development work that is done in the context of the ravines and also want to thank Millie for reminding us of that all my relations perspective and I think a big part of this does need to be economic and a big part of this needs to be focused on youth but I just don't want to forget children on this we try to keep children in the center of everything we do and I think part of it is without question 
you know, protecting land from an indigenous perspective and, and driving economic opportunities. And, and then I think that I, I would hope the strategy isn't just focused on employment and sustainability. I hope there's an education and a wellness component. I think about the, some of the work that I'm doing with, with um, you know, with Tanya Sank. I think there's a big education component through Wandering Spirit, through early on. Um, and I think that we want to provide clear-cut opportunities for Indigenous youth right now, but the next generations that are coming up right now, those little sacred bundles that are just learning how to connect to land and learning Indigenous language and learning uh, how to grow and develop in ways that are connected to land, I think we want opportunities. That's that's critical, right? Because when those guys become youth, they're going to be, if we have the programming set up now with them connected to land and ravines, we're going to see um, tremendous outcomes and capacity, I think. Uh, so just also reminding us to, to keep the little ones at the center of what we do uh, and provide clear opportunities for early on and day camps and all sorts of other opportunities to connect um, um, kids kids to land as well, together with their families. Miigwech. And uh, Madam Co-Chair, Pamela. Thank you. I, yeah, I just wanted to highlight and thank um, thank everyone for the discussion and much to what Jeff was saying. I think, you know, post COVID and for the future that the land is going to be a key recovery piece for the community. And I think um, to Councillor Layton's point said earlier that, you know, this opportunity is prime right now. And if we can continue these discussions and sort of have the city very included in the community and land, that it's going to preserve our future. Um, and I think about the impacts that COVID has had on our community and our little ones um, and the the land-based recovery for the children um, and youth and even ourselves to heal um, for generations to come is going to be critical. And I'm so happy that this group is discussing land um, that, and that it's come becoming a forefront um, theme because I think we've been bogged down with so much items over COVID, um, you know, focusing on crisis that, um, the land is what's going to save the community um, for generations to come. And so I'm so grateful that we're, we're discussing this and that we're discussing it at this table because the, the city will in turn have opportunities to create process and policies that will allow for free land use um, and to protect areas that we can utilize in different ways. Um, so I just want to say that, Miigwech. Oh, also, sorry, Brian. Um, if there are folks that we think should be um, consulted or spoken to, where should we send those names? To, to the IAO? That would be great, Pamela. Okay. Okay. Nakumik, um, thank you, everyone. And based upon this conversation, the city clerks have put together a motion. Um, and I will read it for you. So the uh, the motion to consider is that the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee requests the general manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, in consultation with the director, Indigenous Affairs Office, and other appropriate city staff to incorporate the committee's suggestions on economic opportunities and supporting the Indigenous component of the ravine strategy into the implementation of the Toronto ravine strategy. Would anyone like to suggest any edits to this? Would anybody like to go ahead and, and move the motion? I'm sorry, now that now that the screen is up, I can't see any of you. So looking for hands if there are any. That was so fast I missed it. Can you read it one more time, Brian? Apologies. Yeah, me too. I was hoping you could read it again. <laughs> okay. Uh, that the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee requests the general manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, in consultation with the director, Indigenous Affairs Office, and other appropriate city staff to incorporate the committee's suggestions on economic opportunities and supporting the Indigenous component of the ravine strategy into the implementation of the Toronto ravine strategy. Can I make a comment? You may not be able to see my hand. It's up. Yeah, go ahead. 
I'm just wondering, and I would ask my, you know, my fellow committee members here, if we want to limit this to economic opportunities, so much that we've been talking about includes economic, but also like wellness and education opportunities. And I'm just wondering if we want to restrict ourselves to having them explore economic opportunities, or if we want to be a little bit more holistic and actually look at, you know, wellness and, and, and educational and economic opportunities. I just put that on the floor. This is Andrea. Um, I, I'm in agreement with uh, Jeff. Uh, it, it, we need to make sure that we're dealing with the uh, ecological component too, as well, because we, we're talking about the land, you know, and then we jump into the economy. And, and it's order to be, uh, you know, the community wellness is is really clear. We need to build in there the phrase um, uh, to protect, invest, connect, partner, and celebrate. I think so. We can we can assist in terms of how what does that mean? Um, ecological doesn't talk about our, our animals, you know, and, and so I think uh, um, the well-being of the ecological and our relatives, I think uh, we'll have to add some components, but I agree with uh, Jeffrey, let's not leave it just to the, the economy, then, then, it, then it, uh, we're, we're slipping backwards. So terminology around wellness, terminology around ecological, um, also including the words protect, invest, uh, connect, partner, and celebrate. Prior and then and then add those um, add in the uh, the wellness the wellness and then the ecological but the economy should be the last not the first. Fully agreed. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, clerks, while you're contributing to that change, I see that Tanya has her hand up. Go ahead, Tanya. I just want to agree there that also um, educational. Opportunities are are um, very central in terms of uh, wellness and uh, to echo ecological and sustainability. So I'm going to ask two things right now. One is that the um, wording be put back on the screen as it's edited so that we can see it, and the other is going to be that um, all the. <laughs> Although I said to put your hand up earlier, I will not be able to see you. So please just go ahead and uh, and unmute if you do need to speak during this this editing process. Brian, it's Francis. Um, yes. I'm just a little worried, not worried, but concerned that in the motion that it, it says that we're just suggesting that they listen. I'd rather see that they were directed rather than just a suggestion. It seems a little more forceful that they're, they have to listen to what we said suggestions are just that fully agreed francis so if we can have a little bit uh firmer language um this is indigenous land so thank you for that suggestion Okay, Chair, this is Sylvia. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to edit while displaying. This is our editor view, and it's not allowing me to make any changes. I'm going to ask my colleague, Jonathan, perhaps he can display from his end, and maybe he'll have fewer, um, fewer troubles. Just one second, I apologize. Thank you, Sylvia. And if it, if it needs to go back down, I, I think we can, I think we can mm -hmm. maintain each other's company for a little while longer. Go ahead, Trish. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that like with the changes that we keep in mind what Andrea had said. So hopefully somebody wrote down what she said in terms of relatives and um, also what um, was said by, uh, goodness, what's, I don't see her, oh, there. Also uh, what had been suggested. Um, I don't see her name up there. I just see 019413. 
Tanya. <laughs> I don't know how to change that. So it's okay. Tanya Sank. Okay. Tanya, go ahead. Uh, I just have a, a comment to further echo what Francis was saying about strengthening the language around um, indig Indigenous and being led by Indigenous ways of knowing and being. So if that Indigenous component, like the component word, that, that needs to be strengthened because that, that seems to compartmentalize ideas. Thank you. Excellent suggestion. So we'll just give them a minute now to include these changes. Sylvia, is that you? That's me, yes. Um, okay, you know what? Because there's quite a lot that uh, that came um, out of this discussion, if someone could email um, some of these changes, because the original the motion as drafted echoed simply the language of the questions in the presentation, and the um, intent behind it was just to reinforce that staff who were present for the presentation take into consideration uh, the suggestions that were made. As you are, I see now, working to make this recommendation more specific, um, if I could just please ask, um, perhaps uh, Andrea had, uh, I believe, the sort of the most specific language. Um, if someone could send the wording to ecdc at toronto.ca and we can work on incorporating it into the motion. Um, You've just you've provided me with a lot to uh, to, to try and, and and piece together um, in the moment. No, of course, it's um, yeah, <laughs> it's the first meeting we have with the new co-chairs, and it's virtual, so this is all this is all new. Um, so I'm just wondering if if anyone at the table currently had been writing this out. Um, I know we've got some fairly diligent note takers here. If that's the case, um, Pam, go ahead. I, so I have the original draft, um, so I can just edit it on behalf of the group um, and then send it back to the clerks and then we can post that up if that works for folks. Um, okay. Andrea, be... if you, sorry, Brian. Um, Andrea, if you kindly um, repeat, I know we said wellness, ecological, relatives and economic opportunities is that the were those the headings we wanted there were some of the headings i think there's okay. put some things in there too but, but the, the wellness and our relatives because we were trying to uh, we we're trying to look at we we're trying to look at including the the animals so that's where our extended families the, the relatives were thank you Um, did we hear educational in there? Yeah, it's also educational we had added. Jeff, do you have, are we missing any? No, I don't think you can hear me. Okay, I will send this right now to the clerk. Um, and then we can keep rewording as required. It has been sent, clerk. Malcolm no, Pam, thank you. I didn't anticipate so much uh, so much quiet time on this first meeting. I feel like I should have drafted Larry to tell us some joke. Uh, 
That can still happen. He always has them ready. Jonathan, would it be possible to put up the, the draft motion from Pam? Mr. Chair, we're still working on that. Give us a few more uh, seconds and we can display. Just while we're waiting, Brian, I really would like to, to thank um, the presenters um, on this on this topic for actually giving us something really big to chew on, uh, something that that we all have a passion. Each one of us has a passion for this in a, with a slightly different lens. We're all focused on the same ending, but each one from a slightly different. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see this to have the indigenous lens on everything to do with the with the valleys the rivers the tributaries the coastline you know all these uh, the forests you know the animals the whole business are our, our forest pharmacy um you know all all of this um for the well-being of future generations you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, my great great grandmother, I'm sure looked after the land. That's why I have some place to go to some place to to walk on. And so I want my great 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 grandchildren to be able to say, thank goodness she sat on that committee and they turned things around for Toronto. Because right now, the way it is so much is being. Uh, focus it, it's so important for the city to build another building to take up more land and you can't grow things in concrete you can't you know play in the concrete it's it's just another building so now uh, perhaps it's time for people to listen to our way of knowing and uh, see that it really is visionary not to put and spread concrete over every square inch of Mother Earth that's called Toronto, that there has to be some place left for us to walk and sit on and play and watch grow things, you know, for the next generation. So I'm very grateful to these three women. Do you hear that? Women who raised this topic for us. To miigwech to all of them. Thank you, Francis. And uh, the draft is coming up. Okay, so that the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee requests the General Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation in consultation with the Director, Indigenous Affairs Office and other appropriate city staff to incorporate the committee to consult on wellness, our relatives, education, ecological and economic opportunities and supporting the Indigenous component of the Ravine Strategy into the implementation of the Toronto Ravine Strategy. Any further comments, members? I think uh, this is Andrew's right there. I um, just wanted to make sure I, I get in uh, very clearly the, uh, the to protect, invest, connect, a partner and celebrate that needs to uh, be prior Question. I was just ending. So yeah, would that be prior those... to, to incorporate. Yeah, that should be incorporated in there. And and in terms of the last component in, in supporting the indigenous component of the ravine uh in two spring. So can we capitalize indigenous? Thank you, Ruth. Yes, Chair. I while this is up on the screen, if and if I can ask Andrea to please just advise where the um, where her language should fit, and I will type in the background, and then we'll be able to put up a revised version. I just can't type in the version that's on the screen. Okay, I think that's laying the groundwork for us. 
and when we were speaking to the issue of, of and that was these were wording that were coming from Aaron, or Edith, I should say, uh, within what the approach they were taking and the approaches to to protect, invest, connect, um, partner, and celebrate. And I think that needs to lay the foundation. And then, and then we're working into. Uh, we don't have to consult, but are we we're we're looking at the wellness on the wellness. Wellness, wellness work with the committee. Andrea, do you think that needs to come early on in the motion, or could we tag it on in the end, such as this work should, and then listing off that stuff, or what? What would you like to see here? I'm just curious. As long as as long as it's a guiding, if it's the guiding principle for this initiative, it, whether it's before or after, but it needs to be the guiding principle. Is is what I'm is what I'm saying. I'm 100% with you. I'm just looking at it here and thinking for ease because I know creating motions virtually is um, a yeah, bit of a dance. Yeah. I'm wondering, Sylvia, if it's easier for you to just tack on the end and this work should or this work should be grounded in and then or, or if that's satisfactory to the committee, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, even if it says further, this should be this should be. Um, supported by the foundation of and then you put your five pillars in there. Work should be supported. and celebrate um, okay so I think we missed um, so the, the pillars so to protect invest um, connect partner and celebrate what do those connect to to celebrate the Because if I have um, into the implement implementation of the Toronto Ravine strategy and that this work should be supported um, or should be founded on the principles of protecting, investing, partnering, and celebrating. I think connecting was in there too. You can, you can just say on the principle, on the principle, uh, on principles to protect, invest, connect, partner, and celebrate. And obviously, the celebration will come uh, through all of these initiatives. Each time, we, if we do step phase one, we can celebrate that. But it's, I think, it'll be an ongoing celebration that we go through these different uh, phases of uh, the park life, uh, the, the little ones, you know, the, the animals, the trees, you know, the environment, the, the ability. I, th I think there's there's lots of celebrations that uh, we can have. And again, I, I really appreciate um, having this item on the agenda. We're enjoying ourselves and I still. Mm -hmm. Was um, yeah, this is. Is there um, something, um, I forget which uh, member had talked about it, uh, putting in something different than components? Because that actually, that's a word that always is in my head because I work in HR. <laughs> so it's the jargon that we tend to use, but to strengthen that, use an alternate word. How about instead of um, component, we would say ways of knowing and being? <laughs> so just so members know, we are sort of behind the scenes working on a couple drafts um, and we, we're working, we're chatting with the clerks right now to hopefully um, present something up on the screen momentarily. Thanks, Pam.
perhaps if I might make the suggestion, um, and it might give a little bit more time to get the words precisely right, is if we move on to AA 10.4, because I think there's a presentation on it. Yeah, absolutely. Good call. Thank that you, may Council. Right. Keep us on keep us on time track, but give a necessary so we don't rush the other motion as well. Absolutely. So we will um, move forward and come back to the motion. Um, so the next and last item is item AA one zero point four, the twenty nineteen to twenty twenty two poverty reduction strategy midterm update and Tuckeranto prosperity plan. We will begin with the staff presentation on this item. We will then hear from the registered public speaker before moving it back to the committee. I understand that Wayne Chu, manager of the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office, Social Development, Finance and Administration, and Ken Richard, lead consultant, Toronto Aboriginal Accessibility Committee, will give a presentation to the committee. When you're ready, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much. And if I could ask uh, the clerk to, uh, oh, is, uh, Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we'll go with that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you to the committee for having us today. Um, as indicated, uh, my name is Wayne Chu. I am the manager of the poverty reduction strategy office uh, at the city of Toronto uh, social development finance administration division and joining me today are my colleagues, Sean McIntyre and Hanifa Kassam, who work with me in the uh, poverty reduction office and joining us today is Ken Richard and Nick Chauvin, the team leading work on the Tuckeranto prosperity plan, which we will be speaking to in the second half of this presentation. <clears throat> so if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so as a reminder, the poverty reduction strategy is the city's 20 year uh, strategy to address immediate needs, create pathways to prosperity and drive systemic change uh, for residents who are living in poverty. It is an equity based strategy that recognizes that some communities and some parts of the city disproportionately experience poverty more than others. And at its core, um, the strategy is intended to drive systemic change to address those inequities. There are six themes of the strategy, housing, service access, transportation equity, food access, quality jobs and livable incomes, and systemic change. And to implement this strategy, for each term of council, staff prepare an action plan, which is then adopted uh, by council each term. So we are currently in the second action plan, the 2019 to 2022 poverty action plan, uh, which contains 89 activities, which will be carried out by the end of this term. Next slide, please. So currently we are in the process of preparing a midterm update to the strategy um, and staff will be providing a regularly scheduled update on the status of these activities, these 89 activities to the June 1st executive committee. But as part of our commitment to continuous engagement and to try to um, advance and mature our uh, inclusive engagement objectives uh, through the implementation of the strategy, we are giving the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee, so this committee, as well as the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, the opportunity to provide feedback early in the update process. Feedback that we hear uh, from, uh, from all of you will inform the staff report that will be tabled at the June 1st Executive Committee. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. There's a lag. Go back to housing. Thank you. Um, so I will quickly go over uh, highlights of all six themes. Um, for housing, uh, I will say that um, that actions related to housing are embedded in the city's housing TO 2020 to 2030 action plan, which was adopted by council. Uh, in December of 2019, and because that is the city's overarching housing strategy, and you heard a little bit of a, the housing actions in our previous presentation, um, those uh, updates on housing will be provided through that venue, and uh, in terms of the standing committee, they report to the planning and housing committee. Next slide, please. 
for service access, I usually can imagine a lot of the work that the city uh, uh, was planning on doing with regards to service access and the poverty reduction strategy was disrupted by the current pandemic and COVID-19. Um, and so a lot of services that residents do rely on had to be uh, altered or suspended due to public health guidelines and uh, for the safety of our residents. That said, in partnership with community based organizations, the city of Toronto did and continues to provide modified safe community services and emergency supports for vulnerable and marginalized residents through the pandemic and to coordinate all of this work. We established the community coordination plan and a series of geographically focused clusters of organizations and agencies. Over 400 community agencies are a part of these clusters where work can be coordinated, information shared, and issues triaged. In addition to this, we have worked in collaboration with the Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council. Uh, and um, and their uh, their COVID-19 community response table, as well as the task friends and partners sharing and synergies circle. Next slide, please. The next theme of the strategy is transportation equity and our primary focus for transportation equity is the implementation of the fair pass transit discount program. The fair pass program, if you're not aware, provides a 1 dollar 10 cent discount on single rides on the TTC and a 32 dollar 75 cent discount on monthly passes um, and currently low income residents in receipt of social assistance or a child care fee subsidy are eligible. It is also the only. Um, low income transit discount in the region that it offers discounts for single rides as opposed to just monthly passes. As uh, written about in a staff report last fall, we did have to suspend new applications to fair pass when COVID first hit uh, our community. Um, but renewals for existing clients continue to be processed automatically. Uh, through the fall of 2020, however, we worked to improve back end processes that were more resilient um, to disruptions like COVID. Unfortunately, the, the preliminary process that we had uh, was, was quite manual and was disrupted. Um, and, but we are grateful to our colleagues across the corporation. Um, because on December 15th, we were able to <coughs> using a new online application form. Eligible residents are able to apply at toronto.ca slash transit discount or through the application and support center hotline at 338-8888. Um, I will also say that we are currently in the planning phase to extend the eligibility this year by the end of this year to those uh, in receipt of housing supports, the long term plan pending f uh, funding is to expand eligibility to the program to all Toronto residents who uh, are below the low income measure um, plus 15% threshold. Next slide please. Food access is uh, another theme of the strategy and really was uh, a theme that came uh, became very prominent in our COVID emergency responses um, because of uh, the, the pressures on Toronto public health, um, as well as an ongoing um, reorganization that predated the pandemic. Um, there, the food access work, much of it has shifted from Toronto Public Health over to the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office. So uh, my team um, are, are coordinating a lot of this work. In particular, they're helping to coordinate emergency food supports in the community um, uh, through the establishment of a food access table, but also through a dedicated uh, food hamper program, which is being delivered by by the Red Cross to socially isolated residents who are unable to access other food security supports. As of March 19th, over 54,000 hampers have been delivered. From a policy standpoint, uh, I did want to flag um, 
uh, I guess last week or um, earlier in the week on April 12th, the Board of Health considered a report on advancing black food sovereignty. So that is ongoing. Um, and on June, um, uh, an update on the COVID-19 food access response and the development of food equity framework will be presented at the June 1st meeting of the, the executive committee as part of the poverty reduction update as well. Next slide, please. Inclusive economic development, quality jobs, level of incomes is a key component of the strategy. So uh, on this front, we are pleased to uh, inform this committee that on January 27th, council adopted the advancing community benefits framework report um, and including ref um, and in the 2021 operating budget resources were um, were approved to implement the community benefits framework at the city. And what this framework does is enables the city to better embed inclusive employment and procurement opportunities that come about through city projects such as large infrastructure projects. In addition, we've also secured external funding to advance work to improve equitable access to public sector procurement opportunities across Toronto public sector anchor institutions. So the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office has an initiative called Anchor TO, which is a network of uh, over a dozen public sector institutions, universities, colleges, and the like, all trying to embed and implement social procurement practices. Um, and uh, this funding will be used to increase uh, procurement opportunities and contract opportunities for a range of different social impact and diverse suppliers, including di Indigenous businesses. Next slide. Um, and finally, I want to end my portion the presentation by talking about our sort of uh, our our sixth, but I, in some ways most important theme, systemic change. Um, so there are two particular recommendations that are important in this theme: um, mm -hmm. engaging residents uh, throughout the decision making process as we implement this strategy, as well as dedicating funding to poverty reduction initiatives. And one of the our key flagship uh, actions is to support the development of mm -hmm. the Tuckeronto Prosperity Plan, which is under development right now. And so this project is intended to empower the Indigenous community to identify priority areas of action and achieve real results and systemic change for Indigenous residents. And uh, particularly important is that we hope that this plan will include specific resource asks which we can embed into future budget requests as part of the City of Toronto's poverty reduction strategy investments. So um, to talk a little bit more about the Tuckeronto Prosperity Plan, I want to turn it over to uh, Ken who will uh, speak about uh, the plan as well as how that's connected with uh, TARP 2.0. Ken? I'd like a slide, please. Uh, while I'm waiting for that, just uh, it's so uh, nice uh, to be back with uh, with you folks. Uh, uh, those who know, uh, uh, I go back a long way. Indeed, at the very beginning of the, the council around amalgamation, uh, 1999, if you can believe that was was uh, my first engagement with the city on this on this level of dynamics. So. Spent a lot of time with you folks in the trenches on these issues, and uh, I'm, I'm just so happy to uh, come back on something that actually uh, means a lot to me uh, in terms of my uh, aspirations and things I want to do in life. Uh, poverty has been the, one of the most pervasive uh, dynamics uh, confronting Indigenous Canada, and so many things. Uh, can be traced to uh, so many expressions of the problems we talk about all the time can be traced to just the lack of a uh, of a, a sufficient income to to live life not in a good way but just in any way so that we are uh, getting at uh, a conversation at least that will take us to a place of understanding is great but this is all part of a um uh, a couple of things that are going on at one at the same time. Uh, we're going to try to make it a little sequentially, and that is one is looking backward, not backward, looking before, 
uh, and that is at TARP, Toronto Aboriginal Research Project. Many in the room know, because they were active on that, uh, is a document, one of the largest studies undertaken of an urban Indigenous population in the country, uh, uh, giving us 58 recommendations, uh, all related to uh, the good and welfare of the Indigenous community in Toronto and a number of key areas. Um, and we are uh, going to have a look at uh, that in kind of a 10-year retrospective and uh, draw some conclusions through community consultation on their experiences with the community over the past 10 years as informed by TARP and draw uh, an understanding of where that uh, may have taken us. Um, I can tell you right now without, you know, opening the door too much, um, that uh, poverty will uh, yet again emerge because it emerged as a, one of the central themes in TARP, it'll emerge again. So it's quite right and natural and almost a gift that we have an opportunity to, from looking behind at what happened to look to today and actually turn our eyes to the horizon a little bit. And I'm uh, particularly excited and you may regret this, uh, to the city, and I say that jokingly, but to introduce the uh, conversation about systemic change, I guarantee you will result in hard conversations. Uh, poverty alleviation is to be congratulated. The, the delivery of food to, to housebound vulnerable people, who can say that's not a good thing? However, however, it's uh, uh, food security is more than hampers. Indeed, hampers the word itself. Those who have lived a certain life will know that when hampers are being distributed, you no know, families are in deep distress. And uh, so, so just even changing the conversation uh, is uh, is a good beginning. Uh, and understanding the colonial legacy with respect to all models of charity. Um, so, so without preaching too much, because I am uh, impartial and consultant, but we would like to to get to that kind of higher level. And there are markers for that that perhaps you haven't seen yet, but we'll bring them to you. And that is, uh, there's a document uh, done by people who might know the name Simon Brackapape out of Carleton University. He did a wonderful paper uh, on, on Indigenous prosperity and some of the systemic things that can actually be done to, to uh, assist folks. So, so we'll be introducing uh, in the conversation kind of that higher level looking towards a bigger horizon to see if we can uh, stop having the same conversation over and over again. Because we have been. We keep saying we're poor, we're poor, we're poor forever. And um, it's really timely and a wonderful opportunity with all this disruption that's going on and uh, the big heart that people are demonstrating to, uh, to have a good look at things. So if you go to the next slide. I've probably given my whole presentation right now. Anyway, there are specific objectives. I we we will dovetail certainly uh, because it's, it's the focus of conversation, uh, and it's not a bad one. Those six areas of inquiry uh, uh, with an indigenous lens: housing, stability, service, access, transportation. You can read the list. Those are great. Those are great. I I, I uh, it's the level of discussion and and uh, the actionable items that will come out of that that uh, pertain to our particular community because right now the indigenous lands hasn't been i think appropriately applied although the consultations are there the actual filters are not so we'll introduce that uh, and by the way all of this is through and somewhere on these slides that i'm not even reading is uh, such a high level of not only community consultation but stakeholder engagement we're referencing the province, for example. Well, I would I'd love to, to to hear what the province's ambitions are with respect to this. After, after, and I won't get political too much, but after killing that experiment on 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 a basic income, for example, and I, I'm wondering just what you might have to say about that. And I say this as a general statement of the uh, province in lieu of that, or is this more a conversation? And I think the community is going to hold. Uh, the world uh, a little bit the task on that, the world being the province and other stakeholders that perhaps say one thing and but their policies, their behaviors, their actions might indicate another. So th there will be an opportunity there kindly and with consensus and collaboration because it's not about a big fight, but to just peel away some of the most fundamental issues. 
go to the next slide. I think I have two more. Yeah, so, you know, some of the outcomes are uh, engagement, certainly um, uh, give uh, folks information so that they can engage that conversation in a knowledgeable way, in a fulsome way. Um, we'll be looking certainly at, at, at models um, uh, with respect to prosperity. There are practices. Uh, there are things that have been done. People have had a war on poverty going since I was a little kid. So a few things have come out of that that uh, tell us what uh, what uh, what uh, what might have some impact on poverty. This is how, for example, Head Start programs got into existence in the early in the '60s in the states. It was actually part of Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty. So you got to be a really old guy to know this stuff. But this is there are things that can happen. Uh, with uh, this level of conversation. Uh, but the key role of that will be funding sustainability. It will be um, uh, something that will allow uh, something to, to emerge because these things take time and it takes a lot of talk. Uh, but um, uh, again, the prosperity plan will be kind of like representing a phase one in terms of actionable movement through a community consultation, through a stakeholder engagement. One of the features um, uh, is uh, maybe it's on the next slide, but I just whether it is or not, I'll tell you there's an accountability uh, process to those who are actually impacted by poverty. So one of the reference groups in the indigenous context will be um, a representative sample, if you will, or uh, of folks who have lived experience struggling, you know, who, who know what it's like to run out of food, uh, who know what it's like to uh, be houseless. Um, and have them uh, be actively part of this uh, and uh, provide advice. We can count an accountability committee, a community committee, whatever we want to call it, but it's authentic, unvested folks that will give a clear picture and we'll be sure to recruit some of the uh, some of those who have things to say and it, it, we should have some lively engagements in that in that area. Um, so it'll, it'll include basically key actions associated with poverty alleviation is our aspiration all through that collective process of problem solving. Go to the next slide. So just conceptually um, and simply, here's something I can understand. Uh, we're going to take TARP 2 reference and, and bring it in a modern conversation with respect to prosperity uh, and create some kind of final action plan that will have the tangibilities, I think, that we're all looking for. All through the appropriate protocols with community consultation, stakeholder engagement, and a kind of hopefully a simplicity. Because you read some of the documents that come from people, I'm just, like, I fall asleep. You know, we need usable documents that uh, folks can, can, can utilize, and we hope to present such a document. So I think that's that's all I'm going to say on this. And uh, thank you again for an opportunity to be here. And I've lost to say about ravines, by the way, but never mind. We'll get to that. I'm going to do a deputation because I'm talking to you from the banks of Garrison Creek here. And um, uh, <laughs> thanks, Big Rich. Thank you, thank Ken you. and Wayne. Uh, we're now going to hear from the registered public speaker, and then we'll bring it back to the committee for questions of staff and speakers. We have just the one registered public speaker on this item, so I will ask the committee secretary to confirm that our first public speaker, Miguel Avila Velarde, is ready to proceed. Mr. Chair, I can confirm that our public speaker is ready to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Miguel. Yeah. Oh, and. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to remind you that you have five minutes to speak, and when you're getting close to the end of time, I will let you know. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this uh, this item on the agenda is very important for me because um, I live in poverty. I have lived in poverty for 10 years since I lost my job at the Toronto Zoo, unfairly. So um, I heard with great attention the conversation with regards to the the item on the on the agenda A10.2 A filling the vacancies. I listened with attention to the previous uh, presenter, Ken. He said things that were right to say, like he nailed it right on. In order to for you guys to implement these reports and reports and reports and reports that you get, 
by the by the every year and they just sat, sit down and collect dust in my opinion what you need to have is in your composition is to have people from the community who are who have living experiences if some of the recommendations that were made to incorporate people from the community in particular I'm interesting in the position of uncle because i'm i'm 56 years 56 year old I have three children and I, I have a lot of tons of experiences. So this I think is so important to me that I'm gonna talk on the slide number number hold on a second. I have the slide number. Slide number eight, the quality jobs and livable incomes. Um with regards to the community benefits framework, this is the way of the future, in my opinion. And in Toronto community housing, in December of last year, they 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 um they signed an, um, with the developer of uh, Faces Four and Five of Region Park, uh, the implementation of the CBA for Region Park, and we achieved the grassroots groups movement, the coalition. $28.1 billion to be used for the implementation of the CBA recommendations in the framework from the community. I'm talking about opportunities for employment. I'm talking about home ownership opportunities. I'm talking about scholarships. I'm talking about improving the quality of life of people to get in off poverty. And, and uh, we're living such a, such an exciting time that we are in, in endeavor in improving the life of the people in phases four and five. And this can in this recommendation that the poverty reduction strategy is, is, is making to this committee, I agree with it a hundred percent, a hundred percent and behind these uh, suggestions by the city. I think of the councillors as well for implement for helping to convince the mayor and other stakeholders. So we need those changes that will help in reality people out of poverty. Now I want to talk to uh, slide number um, four: housing stability highlights. Um, housing is one of those um, uh, recommendations by public public health to increase the life of people. Well, wellness. Um, that's uh, April the sixth. Um, a group of, of um, indigenous uh, people living in Allen Gardens, part of the encampments in the city of Toronto, their evictions were put on hold because the city believes that because of the pandemic, they, are hold, they don't know if, they, if these residents will, will thrive in an environment that is covered by COVID. There is an outbreak of COVID in the shelter system. Um, I want to say that you, yes. you have one minute. Oh yeah. So because of COVID, we have evictions happening every day at the, at the landlord and tenant tribunal. And I know that the city has um, approved to allocate 20% of, of all the uh, housing projects to be uh, dedicated for indigenous people. I, I, I thank that initiative that is happening and I wonder if the, the announcement made by the city mayor and the, and the federal government will follow the same recommendation that the units at 222 Spadania Avenue and 878 Young Street will be allocated 20% for those residents because the residents who are in Allen Gardens, that they want to have a better deal. They don't want to be pushed into a hotel 10 miles away from the downtown core. They have roots and they have communities in the downtown area. So please, if you're going to accommodate those uh, people on the on your list of priorities, have consideration on the people living in incumbents who are indigenous people. Thank you very much. And that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks, Miguel. Um, members, do you have any questions for the public speaker? And Miguel, please um, mute your your mic. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say something. <clears throat> Go ahead. 
Uh, Miguel, I appreciate uh, you bringing up how the houseless are uh, timid and not wanting to go into the shelter systems where uh, COVID uh, cases live. Um, so we can see in this way that there is a different worldview at play um, and that these uh, people seem to have found a healthy way for them to live. And I would support them uh, uh, for us to keep them safe and unmolested by the police force with uh, evictions. Um, we really truly need to walk the talk of what we promote here. And while we call them the houseless, I tend to look at them as community. Uh, one in four street people are indigenous people. And so we need to keep them safe. Miigwech. Thank you, Millie. Would any other members like to speak? I, Councilor Layton? Thank yes, thank you. Just in response to um, the announcement yesterday, <clears throat> I do know that uh, one of the two properties is in Ward 11, and this is 877 Young Street. Um, and we've been told by staff, and it was in the announcements that the uh, currently, we don't know who the operators will be that actually provide support. So what what communities will um, uh, will be brought into that space? But we do know that consideration is being given to the indigenous community and indigenous individuals experiencing um, uh, homelessness. I don't know what agencies are being engaged. The councillors have been privy to that level of, uh, of discussion, but I think it's all it, it's it's being done in. Um, in consultation with the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness, and they're trying to figure out sort of the three or four agencies that will work within um, or, or, or take take control of the units within the building. So um, I certainly have opened the doors wide to uh, to to uh, inclusion of the Indigenous community in that project, and I hope that staff are taking it seriously. And it does sound like um, uh, like they indeed are. Thank you for that. Are there any other speakers? Any other members? May I ask a question? Suzanne? May I ask a question? I, uh, this is of uh, <clears throat> Wayne Chu. Uh, I'm, um, I would just like to have a better idea on slide seven. Uh, you mentioned as of March 19th, 54,359 food hampers have been delivered by the Red Cross. And I'm just trying to uh, get it straight in my head. How many households does that represent? Like how many households were served, uh, were supported through that program? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to um, my colleague, Sean, if that's all right, who is coordinating our food access uh, response. Hello there, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Um, so, yes, I can give you uh, an idea of how many households in any given uh, two week period. There are approximately 2000 households that are served by the Red Cross program. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, members, any further questions? Comments? Anyone? Just a question for Sean it's Francis. Uh, Sean, how many? Do you have any idea how many Indigenous hampers were delivered as well? Thank you for the qu question, Francis, and uh, through the co-chairs. Um, I don't have that data in front of me. Um, there is some. Uh, there is data that is being collected by the Red Cross as they. Uh, uh, look at as part of the food hamper program, they are also doing uh, safety and well being checks and learning about the whole individuals and the whole households. So that data is something we can request um, uh, and I can share if it is available, but I do not have that in front of me. Uh, maybe I could add one other comment on that. The um, 
uh, the promotion of this particular program as part of the emergency food response is it's supported by many community organizations supporting a variety of uh, individuals across the city and certainly uh, many of I believe the organizations that you represent and, and others um, would be pushing this to uh, members of the Indigenous community but I, I, I don't have the specifics right now happy to ask and report back on that thank you just want you to know that since uh, March 2020, our organizations have been delivering food at an amazing rate, uh, whether it be hampers or uh, meals on wheels or a food line. Uh, there has been much done from within the community. Very aware of that. Thank you, Francis. Are there any more speakers to the item? If you wish to speak, please put up your hand. This is great conversation. Lots of really interesting information, guys. Thank you. Hearing no further speakers, do I have a motion to receive the item? I see a motion from Pam. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, that is everyone. So I, I guess no one is opposed. Um, so the motion carries. And now I guess we will go back to the previous item um, because I believe there has been a motion drafted. Um, Sylvia or Jonathan, one of the clerks, would you be able to put that up for us? Mr. Chair, we will display it. Okay, so it's been broken up into two pieces now. So the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee requests the general manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, in consultation with the director, Indigenous Affairs Office, and other appropriate city staff to incorporate the committee's suggestions on wellness, our relatives, education, ecological and economic opportunities into the implementation of the Toronto Ravine strategy and long-lasting Indigenous placemaking initiatives. This work must be grounded in the principles, protect, invest, connect, partner, celebrate, and incorporate Indigenous ways of knowing and being. The piece number two, the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee recommends that the Executive Committee request the General Manager, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, in consultation with the Director, Indigenous Affairs Office, and other appropriate city staff to consult with the broader Indigenous community on the implementation of the Toronto Ravine strategy. Members, do we see any other suggested, uh, any other edits that should be suggested or would somebody be comfortable making this into, uh, sorry, uh, motioning this? I'm happy to move it, Mr. Co-Chair, if there's no further comments from the committee. It's Andrea, I agree. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So with um, with Jeff's move, then uh, all those in favor. Okay, and any opposed, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, the motion carries. And uh, thank you so much for all of your patience, everyone. Um, this has been, you know, an interesting <laughs> first run for us. So uh, I'm happy to say that we will now be having our closing blessing from Larry Frost. 
Larry, if you can take us through in a good way, Malcolm. Here. Well, I'm very excited and passionate okay. to close to close this uh, co-chairs. Okay. First, I want to thank the creator for you, Pam and Brian. Sorry, you just, sorry. is there something? Um, Pam, sorry, sorry. Sure. There's one last motion that the clerks would like to put sorry. up, and that's just to excuse the, those um, individuals who are not uh, among us today. So, if I can ask my colleague to display that motion okay. and. Uh, co-chairs, if you can ask someone to please move it. Thank you, Sylvia. And the motion is that the Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee excuse the absence of Angus Palmer, Blanche Mayawasigi, Nancy Martin, Regina Hartwick, and Steve Teakins from the April 16, 2021 Aboriginal Affairs Advisory Committee meeting. Can I have someone um, motion this item? I see Francis first. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Sorry, Larry, as you were. Please take a That's seat. okay. I'm still passionate. I'm still passionate, but I, I want to thank you, Creator, with passion, uh, Pam and Brian. You did such a good job today, and from all of us, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps as I said that you did very, very well. Continue that good, good journey you're on. And I ask the Creator to thank for bringing us together today and guiding us in a positive way, always walking with us in our journeys, giving us good health, which is so important for the work we do that we continue to do the good work we do for our community and never forget that why we're here. With passion and our and our hearts are always connected with our spirits, we, we always say miigwech, miigwech to the Creator and thank you. So with that, I say Creator, always guide us in a positive way with good hearts and good spirits. Miigwech, thank you. Nakumi, Clary Frost, thank you very much. Um, that concludes our business for today. Thank you, members, staff, and presenters. Um, our meeting is now adjourned, and thank you, Madam Co-Chair, as well. Not going to make. Be great to be well, everyone. Have a great day. Have a great day. Good job.